Christine Wells has a gift for digging out history's hidden stories, and her latest book, The Royal Windsor Secret, is the perfect delicious mix of fact and speculation that her readers have come to love. In it, Christine asks the question, what if Edward, Prince of Wales, the man who briefly became King Edward, had a love child? Hi there, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler, and a chance remark from a friend suggesting Edward sowed wild oats during his stay in Australia in his youth got Christine thinking. The result is another of her engrossing historical fiction tales with plenty of fascinating historical fact spiced up with some what-if suggestions. This is Christine's second appearance on the Binge Reading Podcast. She was on it back in 2020, talking about her World War II stories like The Juliet Code and Sisters of the Resistance, the last one featuring Catherine Dior's little-known wartime activities. Our reader offers this week include a sales special on Unbridled Vengeance, that's book five in the Of Gold and Blood series. We've also got another Kobo free genre list offer running until October 8th. Lots of great books in multiple genres available for free download, including Sadie's Vow, book one in the Home at Last series. Details of things mentioned in this episode, as well as links for where to get these free books in the show notes for this episode on the website thejoysofbingereading.com and remember if you enjoy the show leave us a review so others will find us too but now here's Christine hello there Christine and welcome to the show it's great to have you with us hi Jenny thanks so much for having me the last time we talked together on binge reading was in May 2020 and a tremendous amount of stuff has happened since then including a pandemic At that time, you were writing about World War II women spies. And this latest book changes things up a bit, doesn't it? It's not about spies anymore. It's about possible secrets in the Royal Windsor family. Tell us a little bit about the Royal Windsor Secret. The Royal Windsor Secret is a story about Cleo Davenport, and she's a young woman who's grown up in Cairo in Egypt. And she lives at the luxurious Shepherd's Hotel And she comes to believe that she is the secret illegitimate daughter of the King of England, who was actually Edward VIII, who abdicated the throne to marry Wallace Simpson. And so she goes on a quest to find her true parents. And there's also a thread about jewellery and Cleo's love for jewellery. And of course, Wallace Simpson loves jewellery too. That plays a big part in it. Cleo wants to design, be a jewellery designer. So that's another thread to the story. Fantastic. Now you take some early true events in the Prince of Wales's life, and then you add a little bit of your own speculation to those events, don't you? Tell us a bit about how you wove fact and fiction into your story. Well, a little bit of a kernel of an idea came to me when a friend said that one royal personage, I think it was Edward VIII, had been out west in Queensland as part of their early Commonwealth visits. The the young royals would come out to Australia for a while and there were an awful lot of children born to families in that region who looked very much like the Duke of Windsor. And that that set a little kernel of what is in my mind. But the early events you're referring to, the Duke of Windsor, who was the Prince of Wales at the time, was stationed in France in World War I. And probably his first real affair as such was with a French courtesan called Marguerite Mella, as she was at the time. And in those days, it was still the days of the high-class courtesan a la Gigi, somebody who was very refined and skilled at all different things, conversation and knew about politics and could be more than just a mistress, but a real companion to the men that they liaised with. So Marguerite was in this old school style of courtesan and he had an affair with her 
it's pretty well accepted that he did. And she wrote a memoir. We don't know if we can really trust Marguerite, but there are references to her in his letters as well. I started to think, what if there was an illegitimate child who was the product of this liaison? And that's where Cleo Davenport comes in. What sort of age difference was there between the two of them when they met? I got the impression that Edward was quite young and inexperienced in terms of sexual matters at the time that they met. Was that a correct yes. idea? Yes. It's not really clear when Marguerite was born, but I think she would have been in her 30s and he would have been very young, around 20s. Yes, there was a big age gap. And it, it was really, at least to him, it was not serious. He would say he loved her and spout all of these romantic things in his letters, no doubt. But in reality, he, it wasn't like Wallace Simpson. I don't think he ever was serious about her. He, she, he was quite besotted with her at the time. Is there any indication that she was his first lover? It sounds like the Queensland experience might put the lie to that for a start. No, I, I think she was probably maybe not his first lover, but his first ongoing lover. So very early, he was very uh, naive. And I think there was some kind of racy novel that he had been given to read by some older man and it opened up an entirely new world to him. And then he started pursuing romantic relationships when he was away from scrutiny from his family and in France. And what goes on in France stays in France. But of course, the royal family has always been quite permissive in respect to the men for the family's affairs. The only thing you have to do is be discreet. And usually they would choose married women. And any children of the relationship would be just accepted as a legitimate child of that marriage. Usually it wasn't even an issue to have illegitimate children around, but, and a number of them have been taken care of financially and so forth. So that's where Cleo growing up quite privileged came from. Yes. I gather this Marguerite has a very colourful life, shall we say, and we're not going to do any spoilers by giving away too much information about what happens later in her story, but potentially she becomes an embarrassment to the Duke in her later life. And I gather that he actually destroyed the pages of his diary that related to those earlier years. He definitely tries to obscure the trail of it. Is that factual? Yes, I believe that's the case. Andrew Rose, who wrote a couple of nonfiction books about Marguerite and her affair with the Prince of Wales, as he was then, the Duke of Windsor, he got permission to look at the archives. And that was his finding that they'd been ripped out of the diary of the times. No doubt either he'd done that after their affair ended quite acrimoniously or later on when other scenes unfolded and Marguerite came back to haunt him. Yeah. Marguerite was a, an extremely tenacious and strong-minded woman and she could definitely make a lot of trouble for anyone if she set her mind to it. The book's had some great reviews. I'm just going to quote from a Washington Post one where it, where it says, an absorbing novel that wends its way from Cairo to Paris, then on to London, Lisbon and the wilds of Scotland, a globe-trotting trail of romance and mystery wrapped in historic detail. The reception of the book must have pleased you. What's the most exciting thing for you about the things that have happened so far? Oh, look, that was a bit of a highlight, the Washington Post. And the highlight to me is hearing from my readers because they're the people I write the books for in the first place. So they're just starting. It's just been released in the United States. It's yet to be released here. That release date is on the 4th of October. You just love hearing once the readers start reading and getting all these lovely messages from people. That's what really it's a reward for me. I, I love writing and I would probably do it even if I didn't have any readers, but it, it's really nice that all that hard work is appreciated. A large part of the book does take place, as you've mentioned, in 
the Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, which I must admit I didn't realize existed, but it's got a really famous history of its own, hasn't it? What attracted you to part of the story there? And tell us about Shepherd's. Well, Shepherd's Hotel, I first read about Shepherd's Hotel in Elizabeth Peters' amazing Amelia Peabody mysteries, which if you haven't read them, you must. They're just fabulous. And it's about a Victorian young lady who inherits money and decides that she's going to take off to Egypt and meets an Egyptologist. It's a series about how they dig up mummies and solve mysteries, but it's just so witty and wonderful. And they always stay at Shepherd's Hotel. But I didn't think much more about that. I think I came across Shepherd's probably when I was researching the Juliet Code, because the SAS, the Special Air Service, was actually conceived and planned in Shepherd's Hotel, basically. So I was writing about the SAS and then I was learning about Shepherds and all the famous people who would stay there. And there was Winston Churchill and Josephine Baker, Mark Twain, all of the Europeans and a lot of Americans too, used to winter in Egypt. And Shepherds played host to royalty and movie stars, Rita Hayworth, Yaga Khan. So it was just full of these interesting people. Lawrence of Arabia used to sit in the foyer and dre- dressed up as a sh- sheik and jump out the window when the press came after him. There's all of these wonderful stories. And there's a story about how the keeper of the left luggage room would know exactly where your thing was years later when you came back. So Winston Churchill left a book of poetry there in World War I. He came back in World War II and it was there waiting for him. So it's just all these wonderful stories that came out of it. And I really wanted to set up there. How did it come about that the SAS was actually conceived there though? Was it just a coincidence? There were a lot of influential men there at the same time or? All the officers used to stay there in World War II, and that's where the heads, now their names are escaping me, but the men who set up the SAS, because it was basically an initiative of the officers who were in another regiment, and they decided that what needed to happen was to go in behind enemy lines and and sabotage the Germans and the Italians' defences in the north of Africa. Africa. And they really had to do rigorous training. They had to be able to walk long distances or march long distances with very little water. There was a story actually of one fellow who survived. He was abandoned or everybody else died or something happened on his mission. And the way he survived on his way back to civilization was drinking the water out of radiators of abandoned vehicles on the way they were incredibly tough and just these amazing men and they go out on missions and they come back you're full of sand long beards and they go and stay at shepherd's hotel (laughs) in between missions sounds wonderful and one of your main characters does have some time in the sas during the war doesn't he Yes, Cleo's love interest, Brody, joins the SAS. And so we see that in the other side of the action, the anxious waiting while he's on missions, Mm. while Cleo waits for him to come back. Mm. Now, Cleo, as we've mentioned, she's passionate about developing a career as a designer of high fashion jewellery. And you have a lot of, I found, fascinating detail about the top jewellers and the fashions of that time, the 1920s and 30s. I wondered how you researched that aspect of the story. Oh, it was a tough, (laughs) tough job. There's a wonderful book about the Cartiers by one of their descendants. And so I learned a lot about how they worked at the time because that era was really their heyday. They've never gone away and I'm sure they go from strength to strength. But the connection with Cartier is that Wallace Simpson 
bought a lot of her jewellery there and was given a lot of jewellery by the Duke of Windsor. And it was very personal jewellery. She had a bracelet full of crucifixes that marked a different special occasion in their relationship. And of course, her engagement ring came from there. So that was a theme I really wanted to explore because, of course, the Windsors are part of this story. And the Cartier connection really connects the two. You mentioned also a famous flamingo brooch. Oh, yes. It's in a style called the Tutti Frutti, but it actually wasn't called that at the time, unfortunately. So I had to call it what they termed it, Pierre de Couleur. And so it's emeralds, rubies and sapphires. So it's all this multicoloured, amazing and the designer, Pierre Lynn Marchand, who was also in the book, used to go to the Paris Zoo and study animals just to make sure he got them their anatomy really right. And especially with the panther as the icon of Cartier, if you look at his bracelets, for example, sinuous panther just wraps around your wrist and it looks like it could easily jump off your wrist and come to life. They're just so beautifully done. Yes. And Le Marchand also, he was a bit subversive, wasn't he? He styled a liberty bird, which got up the Nazis' nose and put it, got himself into trouble with them, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, and Jean Toussaint, who was the cre- creative director at the time, were hauled in for questioning because they had made this brooch that had a caged bird and it was seen to be subversive that really did symbolize the French under German occupation. But they were able to say that this is a motif they'd used before. So they got away with it, but there is a story that Coco Chanel intervened on their behalf. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. That's interesting because I was going to ask you, In all the research you did in this period and with all these famous people, what was the most surprising piece of information that you uncovered and perhaps something that didn't even get into the book? But were there any surprises for you amongst the things you learned? I was very surprised, and this did make it into the book, about the attitude of Edward VIII slash Duke of Windsor towards and had known that he was a sympathizer, but until I started researching this book, I didn't quite realize the extent of it. And there are arguments both ways, but I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that he probably, if the Nazis had occupied Britain, they would have made him king and made Wallace Simpson queen. And that was quite shocking to me because looking back now, and knowing what the Nazis did, you can't imagine anybody who would, be in their right mind, would support them, especially not their occupation of your country. But it seems that the Duke of Windsor might have. Yeah, I found that incredibly shocking. Yes, it, it showed him to be a remarkably short-sighted guy, really, didn't it? I think, as I say in the book, he loved Germany because A, he had a lot of relatives there and B, he spent a wonderful time there with his cousins when he was a young man. He was fluent in German. Uh, Obviously, the royal family and the aristocracy were a little bit taken with fascism because the alternative at that stage was communism, which Mm. meant that they'd be (laughs) out of a job and out of a position and possibly taken against a wall and shot, they were extremely affected by the Russian family's demise. But I think that by the time we're talking about, it was pretty clear that Hitler had an agenda that was going to put Europe into a darkness. Even at that stage, they were executing Jews and Poland had been invaded. All these other countries had been occupied. I think I get that they were starting to sympathize with the fascists early in the 30s, but not later on when it became clear that this was how they were going to operate. 
Well, last time we talked, we did talk about the Juliet Code, and since then you've written uh, a book about the real Miss Moneypenny. Tell us a bit about that book and any other things you think of, in, of interest in the last couple of years. I wonder how the pandemic affected you, for example. First question, the One Woman's War. I had such a good time writing this book. It was inspired by a real woman called Patty Bennett. And she was secretary to Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond novels. She worked for him during World War II and naval intelligence. A lot of people don't actually know that Ian Fleming was involved in intelligence. He wasn't an agent himself. He was rather higher up in the food chain. He was the assistant to the head of the naval intelligence. And in those days, the Navy really had the most sophisticated intelligence service because they would be in charge of monitoring all of the communications on the ships. And also Paddy was involved in Operation Mincemeat, which uh, you might have seen the movie or heard about it. It, it was a, a scheme to fool the Germans into expecting the Allies to invade in the wrong place in the south of Europe. They fooled them into believing that it was going to be Balkans or Greece rather than Sicily, which was the obvious place and which ended up being the, the place they did invade. I just found her so fascinating. She's such a redoubtable woman and it was a real joy to write about her in One Woman's War. Fantastic. Um, I did see the trailer for Operation Mincemeat and I thought it looked fabulous. I'm, I was just a bit sad that I didn't quite get to see the full movie, but it looked fascinating. Yes, I went to see it and uh, Patty wasn't even in it. They kaleidoscoped her role with the role of another woman who was involved. I was a bit sad about that, but anyway, that left me some room to tell my story too. And how about the pandemic? Did it make it difficult to do research? Yes, actually it did. For One Woman's War, there was an archive that I would have loved to have had access to, but it was in England in the Winston Churchill archive and you couldn't even contact someone there to look it up for you because they were all shut down. That was a shame because it was a scrapbook of Patty's husband. It wouldn't have just been vital to the research, but it would have been really great for some background. Mm. And I think it had letters and things like that in it too. In a way, it was good for writers to be stuck at home because there wasn't much distraction. And uh, when my children were homeschooling, we would all go off to our offices and rooms to do our study for the day and me writing my books and then we'd meet up for lunch and then we'd go back again and it, it was quite a nice routine, but uh, not that I would wish that on the world for that reason. We always like to check with our writers about the books they're reading at the moment. So just to check back in with you, what have you been reading over the last couple of years? Is there anything that you'd like to recommend to listeners? I have been binging on McHeron's Slow Horses series. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you might know the the television series on Apple TV, um, yeah. which really is a brilliant adaptation, but the books are just fabulous. And I think one thing I noticed with Mick Heron is he has to describe the same place in every book. And in every book, he manages to find a new way to describe it. The books are about the misfits from MI5 in London who bungle their ways through all of these cases and end up saving the days. It's funny and it's clever and uh, I love a spy novel. So that, those ones are great. And then just recently I read an advanced copy of Natasha Lester's The Disappearance of Astrid Ricard, which I highly recommend if you love full fashion and the history and there's a real feminist theme through this book. It's just fantastic. I love the authorial comment about McHeron because a lot of readers may not even quite think of something like the fact that he's describing the same places, but finding something fresh to say about them. Yes, it's a real skill when you're writing a series to come up with something new every time. Mm. Yeah. 
We've had Natasha on the show at least once, maybe more than once, and I love her work too. So she's another Australian author doing wonderfully internationally, isn't she? Oh, yeah, she's amazing. And we actually have the same literary agent when she was last in Brisbane. We met up and had a lovely time. So yeah, she's a lovely person as well. What's next for Christine as author? What have you got on your desk over the next 12 months? What are you working on at the moment? At the moment, I'm finishing the first draft of a book called The Paris Gown, which is about three young women in 1950s Paris who share a Dior gown. It's a bit of a harking back to Sisters of the Resistance, which was about Catherine Dior a couple of books ago, and we did an interview on that one. And yes, and then the next book I've also sold to the same publisher, so that will be following up is tentatively titled The Lost Perfumes of Paris. So that'll be a lot of fun to go on to next. You always seem to find such fascinating aspects of this history to bring out. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you very much. They really fascinate me. So hopefully they fascinate readers too. Yeah. We have come to the end of our time, but we always do ask, do you enjoy interacting with your readers and where can they find you online? Oh, I love hearing from readers. Yes. I'm mostly on Instagram and Facebook. If you go to my website, christine-wells.com, you'll be able to click through to any of my social media. That's probably the easiest way. That's wonderful, Christine. Thanks so much for your time. It's been wonderful hearing about all this research and, and what we've got in store in the future. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for having me, Jenny. It's been a pleasure. Next week on Binge Reading, Kate Gray, and a stunning psychological thriller, The Honeymoon. Newly wed couples on their honeymoon meet casually in a barley bar. It's a trip of a lifetime until they find the body. Married life wasn't meant to start like this. That's next week on Binge Reading. And remember, if you enjoy the show, leave us a review so others will find us too. Word of mouth is the best way for others to discover the show and great books they'd love to read. That's it for today. See you next time and happy reading.